Um, my name is Simon Duffy from the Centre for Welfare Reform. Just a reminder, this talk is being recorded um, and will be published later. Uh, and I'm really delighted to um, have with me Mary O'Hara. Um, I've known Mary now, I think, kind of, like, although we've never really properly had that much time together, it's but I've known been... Mary for uh, probably about eight years. We first, I first heard of her because she wrote uh, a great article about one of our fellows, uh, Kelly Hicks, when she won uh, Adult Social Worker of the Year Award in 2011. I think Mary wrote an article in uh, 2012. And I thought, who's this Guardian journalist showing an interest in the real world? I thought, <laughs> this is very exciting. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and Kelly said, oh, Mary's wonderful. And then Mary and I linked together a bit as Mary was doing her book on Austerity Bites, which was tracking the, um, the damage done to people's lives by the coalition government, damage which, of course, is still ongoing to this day. Um, and, uh, and then Mary kind of escaped to America a bit, kind of, or half-time or something. That's Mary will explain. Um, and uh, and has been doing all sorts of other wonderful stuff, which some of which she's going to talk to us about, and particularly her book, The Shame Game. So, welcome, Mary. Um, where Glad should we start? <laughs> so, what would you like me to talk about first? Well, can you tell us why you wrote this book? Yeah, um, so there are a number of reasons why I ended up writing this particular book. Um, you mentioned my last book, Osiri Bites, briefly. Um, I see this one as sort of an evolution from that. Uh, when I was doing all the traveling around the UK in 2012, 2013, looking at the initial impact of austerity policies, one of the things, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things that came up time and time again was stigma, was that people felt like they were being perpetually blamed and shamed for things that weren't their individual fault. Um, uh, as many people will know, the rhetoric of the government around that time was pretty fiercely um, anti anybody on benefits, was framing people as lazy spongers and scroungers and skivers and all of that. And I felt that one chapter on that, which is what I had in Austerity Bites, barely scraped the surface. Um, it was very clear to me from that work and, and from the journalism I was doing, that this was a much bigger part of the inequality and poverty that was deepening and widening um, in Britain. And it Really, I just couldn't switch that bit of my head off. I wanted to find out more about why this was having such an extraordinarily effective um, sort of impact on how people were being viewed and treated in the world. I ended up uh, moving to the US, um, in fact, a few months after Austerity Bites was published and started writing from here. And writing from here, it was made me realize that hold on a minute, the, I mean, these two countries are so much more similar than anyone thinks in terms of the way these particular issues are dealt with in the public sphere, are dealt with um, in the media, are dealt with um, in the political universes. Um, so I started um, Project Twist It um, a few years after I was out here to try to learn more about the stigma and shame associated with poverty, reaching out to both in Britain and America, organizations, individuals in this space. I mean, I didn't care whether you were a singer songwriter or um, a anti-poverty activist at a grassroots organization. If you had something to tell me about this, then I wanted to hear it. And then over that time, I built up, you know, a sort of, you know, a wealth of kind of insight and information from various different sources. Um, and that culminated in this book, looking at these issues from as many angles as possible, but especially the angle of lived experience, because it was clear to me that one of the biggest voids in this area were the actual voices um, and insights of people 
who had lived in poverty or who had encountered benefit systems that were perpetually shaming and alienating them and put their voices at the forefront really, um, uh, but laid against the, uh, the academic analysis and the sort of structural um, analysis of these problems. And that's how I ended up producing this particular book. And, and I mean, why, why shame, in a way, why does shame hit the button for you? I mean, well, one of, the, one of the reasons is, I mean, this is a very personal thing to me as well as a professional one. So every time I sat down with someone who was talking about, let's say they were talking about um, the bedroom tax or, you know, a policy that was affecting them, even if I didn't ask about um, how it made them feel, rather as opposed to what it did to them. Um, absolutely everyone I've ever spoken to on this would talk about how um, they felt like they were being shamed um, just for being in a tough circumstance and how that would um, be internalized. And that made me start thinking about my own experience of poverty because I grew up um, in poverty. You know, my, my dad was out of work most of my teenage years and you know we relied on benefits and free school meals and all the rest of it. And, you know, I kind of understood on a visceral level what that felt like, um, what it felt like to walk past the dole office with my dad and, you know, hang my head because it was just, you know, here was a man who until that point worked his whole life and supported his family, blah, blah. And then here he was now sort of on that scrap heap during Thatcher's um, tenure, along with lots of other you know, skilled people and hard going to school. You knew that if you were on free school meals, that that was like something that set you apart. So it, it, it seemed to me that not only do you experience that as a child and an adolescent, if you grow up in poverty, but that it stays with you. So I'm fascinated by the psychological aspects of this um, and the long term damage that this does, because it's not, you know, I think a lot of people who've never experienced poverty um, interpret it as something that is an experience that happens to you and that's it. And either you get through it or you don't, but actually it's much more complex than that. And I think you carry a lot of that with you if you've experienced it as a child. I think a lot of parents um, worry desperately about this because they know that their children are sensitive to these things. Um, I think it can uh, it, it can create um, a sense where kids don't think they can do better, or that the world, uh, or that they fit into the world. And I, to my mind, that's a tragedy. So I think the messages around this, I think the way people are spoken about, the way people are spoken at, has like a really sort of fundamental impact on how our individuals are shaped, how our communities are shaped, and how our society is shaped. Um, it also reduces the capacity to fight it. I think people, you know, I think the thing that people often don't understand is that poverty is exhausting. The shame of poverty is exhausting and there's not an awful lot left to fight either the like abject reality of poverty or to fight against the very powerful um, rhetoric and messages that are used to keep you in your place, if you like, you know, as far as, as far as this poverty narrative goes, you are continually told that you're economically where you deserve to be. And, you know, it's a pretty brutal message to give someone um, at any age, frankly. So you were researching it through people's stories and you're researching it through the academic literature. Mm. I mean, can you construct as a little theory or your understanding now of, I suppose, how does, how does stigma stigma function um, to generate shame or how do you understand shame and poverty really given all of the things like, you've done? I mean there's obviously a lot of people who've written an awful lot on this um, and I was kind of rumbling around in that to sort of try and understand it a bit more but I mean it is that sort of the two aspects of it the sort of external shaming of people which creates the stigma and then the internalizing of that um, which I've already alluded to. And I think that the two things are equally important. You know, it's that this is a mechanism that is deployed for a certain purpose. And in the context of 
poverty. Um, it's deployed to justify um, certain political ideologies or certain policies, um, but it is executed in a way that is, you know, fundamentally um, psychological, really. And I think those impacts are um, severe and often misunderstood. And I think unless we, you know, start from the beginning on this and think, okay, so what is this? What does it do? Why is it happening? Then um, we can't really undo it. Uh, so I think there, my journey through this was very much educating myself about what this meant in the bigger picture and what it meant to individual lives um, and the well-being of people. Um, and you, I think you probably know, Simon, but like a lot of my journalism was on mental health as well. So I, um, bef you know, 15 years ago, I was writing about stigma in mental health. And one of the things that occurred to me during that was, uh, A, it is deep rooted. It is so like intersected with all aspects of the culture and the politics that unpicking it has to be sort of forensically done. Um, but at the same time, I was trying not to get lost in the woods because I am not a psychologist and I'm not an academic. I'm, I'm a person who's supposed to interpret some things that are going on and put that information into um, the public sphere for people to take a look at. So that's essentially what I was trying to do with this, to say, you know, that, that stigma is um, deeply felt, um, profoundly important, and you know, really, really damaging. And when I was when I was looking at shame, obviously, shame has a function in human society. You know, anthropologically, it has done a lot of different things, some good, some bad. Um, but in the context of this, um, there are one group of people that are being repeatedly um, shamed, um, and it is a distraction from the harm that's being done. Um, by political and economic policies. And so that, I mean, that's the way I'm looking at it, it rather than, um, you know, and I've spoken obviously to lots of psychologists who are doing the work on, you know, how this impacts people. Um, I was especially interested in how it impacts children. Um, and you know, how this feeds into things like lower educational attainment, lower life expectancy, all of these, huge social issues, incarceration levels. I mean, you know, the, the stuff around racial justice. I mean, the, all of the, it's massive. <laughs> it's kind of daunting in many ways, but I wanted to look at it from the perspective of what can we objectively see happening? What is the outcome of it? And, you know, what can we do about it? Because whatever it is we've been doing, it isn't working. I pursue this point then, because so, so what you're saying, which certainly tallies with my sense of things, is that stigmatizing people, scapegoating people, mm. is part of a political strategy with a purpose. Um, I mean, for me, I remember very being very depressed when in the New Labour era, uh, I think it was Gordon Brown who approved a campaign that, that characterized people as benefit thieves. And the posters that were out on the streets, you know, that their target audience is people living in poverty, really. <laughs> and the target audience was maybe um, middle earners or people, you know, in a way, this, I'm interested in also, like, in some sense, who's driving this is people with power and money. But in a way, the target audience is, you could describe as the kind of middle class in a funny way. It's like, it's trying to, it seems very much like a divide and rule strategy at times or a kind of getting people to see the enemy as the person down the road from them who appears not to have a job or appears to have some other problem that they might then be faking. So we've got all of these kind of, um, yeah, it's all like these strategies. The, the classic othering and whoever whoever the other is, you know, for um, for uh, some political ends, the other is the immigrant, um, you know, and, and I think one of the, you know, one of the classics of this oeuvre was um, George Osborne, you know, when he was standing at the party conference and, you know, you're, you're on your way to work and someone's in bed with their curtains closed and, and 
for me that there are so many examples of these sorts of statements um uh repeated ad nauseum um you know that you know <laughs> there's just so many of them but that one really struck me because it absolutely showed that they hadn't even thought it through to the point where has it occurred to you that the person who is sleeping at 10 a.m. only got home from work at 8 a.m. and that's why their curtains are closed because they've been in cleaning the bloody office that you're about to go into. So, you know, it, 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 it's strangely a very narrow framing of something, but it's extraordinarily effective. And picking... Um, people on benefits as the target group that you're gonna go after to say, look at us, aren't we terribly efficient? Aren't we um, uh, you know, tightening our belts and making sure the public purse isn't in debt and all of the nonsense that was spewed around that to justify austerity, you have to find someone to blame that on because otherwise it's very hard to justify what you're doing. Um, so even though you know, I know, I'm sure everyone on here knows that the cost of benefits for the public purse is actually very small compared to other things that come out of that. Um, but here is a group of people who um, aren't necessarily organized to defend themselves. Um, are actually too busy working or too exhausted from having to deal with the benefit system um, to uh, counteract these messages. Um, the messages are filtered through um, powerful media um, that reinforce the messages. And, and I think if that's repeated strongly enough and often enough, um, it become, I mean, it becomes what people think is common, you know, common knowledge. It, it enters it enters the lexicon in a way that it becomes utterly acceptable and people see it as a truth. And I find this um, back in the early days when I was talking to people about austerity policies, I would ask someone a question and they would repeat back to me almost word for word what a politician had said on the news the night before. Um, so, you know, these very effective terms, like we all, we're all in this together, we have to tighten our belt, um, the credit card is maxed out, all of that. So I would sometimes find people who were directly affected by these policies telling me that they understood why this had to be done. And that sort of blew my mind because I thought this is so effective this is so effective that a person who is sitting here being told that their benefits are being cut thinks there's a genuine reason why their benefits are being cut. So, you know, when you said that the audience is the middle class, it's actually the audience is also the people affected because you are taking away their capacity to fight back if you are managing to convince even them that you're doing this for a just reason and you're doing it because, you know, we're always told there's no choice. You know, if you're constantly being told there's no choice and back in, back in the day, back at that point, um, the opposition was utterly failing to counteract this. You know, they'd kind of disappeared up their own fundament at that point, trying to sort themselves out. So there was no countervailing force to these messages um, and people just absorbed them and believed them. And over the last 10 years, it seems to have, you know, deepened even more. But I suppose, I, I suppose, I, I, that all seems true, but the the new Labour thing is interesting, Mary, because they started down the road without an austerity plan. Austerity isn't their agenda. I mean, that what you know. So they they were they were playing for some political wins as they saw it, which now look like disastrous strategic decisions. Yeah. At least if your goal is to reduce poverty, but yeah. they were they seem to be pandering to me. Maybe I'm misreading it. But as you said, to like look strong, to appeal to what they perceive as a kind of swing voter who had already kind of half castigated people on lower incomes and was now being encouraged to do so more because, you know, and these things are entirely fictitious, benefit cheats, benefit thieves, yeah. benefit fraud is statistically insignificant, statistically insignificant, and yet it's a thing. People talk but about it. In, in 2010, 2011, you know, the coalition government, then the Tory government, 
simply would not have been able to do what they did had the foundations not been laid prior to that. So had things around justifying conditionality, for instance, not been um, framed by the previous government, it would have been a much harder task. It's just that they went they went for it full fervor, um, but it, it wouldn't have been as easy a slide for them had there not been those foundations laid. And now when, you know, when you look at the US, which is, you know, like literally, um, I mean, a hellscape when it comes to benefits and people trying to get help. Obviously, a lot of the stuff in the 90s and noughties um, uh, when New Labour were around, you know, they were looking across the Atlantic for ideas um, around welfare reform. You know, major welfare reforms were brought in under Bill Clinton that basically um, cut people off at the knees. Um, and conditionality was a big, big part of that, the stigmatizing of poor people. And in the American context in particular, the racial aspect of that, um, this whole idea of the welfare queen, you know, that was sort of, that, um, I was sort of conjured up by Ronald Reagan, um, but reinforced under Bill Clinton, who was a Democrat. So, you know, this is this sort of stuff is not the purview only of people on the right. Um, I think right across the political spectrum, there is either complacency around it or a failure to, you know, challenge it in an effective way. Um, and I say effective because that has to be that has to be what you're talking about here, because what we know. Um, is that over the years, the strategies that have been in place to try and reduce poverty, to win people over to a system of welfare that is fair and equitable and actually something that we can be proud of in the way that you're proud of the NHS. Um, you know, th that hasn't been done. That hasn't been stitched together in a way that brings people on board. And a lot of this is for some reason, and I never really understood this, but <clears throat> with New Labour in particular, you know, they had a stunking majority, um, you know, like really a <laughs> incredible, um, after all those years of Thatcherism and then John Major, um, but didn't try to sell more innovative or radical ideas to the public when they could have done that. And instead, it seemed to me at the time that they were being quite fearful of, um, you know, what they imagined to be Middle England or whatever you want to call it. Um, and therefore, even, even the policies that went through that were good and that helped alleviate poverty um, were kind of pushed through by stealth. I mean, they weren't really like sold as, you know, this is something that we can really change lives with. Um, and they, did, they, they didn't sell it in a way that meant that it penetrated the wider public consciousness. Uh, my experience of some Labour politicians at the time is they actually share the same prejudice against the poor as people on the right. So it's not just lack of courage. I've sat in meetings with senior Labour politicians where and, and think tanks that are supposedly of the left, where the underlying assumption is that people who are in poverty are somehow stupid, uh, that they don't have good intentions, that, that we, they can't be um, allowed to look after their own best interests. Well, so there's a kind of deeper thing that somewhere... Yeah, there is. And it, that, that gets mushed up with paternalism as well. So you've got, in a way, you've got this underlying sort of contempt for people that um, people either do or don't admit to themselves because they think they're good people trying to do good things. Um, but this kind of paternalistic aspect that, you know, we're here to um, take care of you. And, you know, and it feeds into that idea of we're your betters as well. You know, everyone's your betters. I mean, I remember... One time, and again, this was this is when New Liberal were in power, and I was on a story in Liverpool with a um, government minister, and we were walking through a council estate to go to like a community centre to meet with people who were going to talk about their housing issues, etc. And we were just walking up the street, and the housing minister um, looked at me and she said, "Oh, oh, it's not always like this here, you know. It's not always like this here. Like someone had left a sofa outside their back fence." Um, who knows what they were doing with it, probably waiting for someone to pick it up, who knows, but there was a sofa randomly sitting in the street. 
Um, and I was like, what do you mean? And she's like, well, you know, the, the people here are really good people. And I said, look, I grew up on a council estate. I grew up in a place like this. I have no problem with someone leaving their sofa outside if something's going to be done with it. And I was like, I mean, it spoke volumes to me because, A, they assumed that there's no way that me as a Guardian journalist could possibly be from that background. So um, that was like a shocker for them to begin with. But also that I was making the same judgments that they were making, um, which I felt were kind of knee-jerk reactions um, against book volumes. We get into the community centre, the minister speaks, a couple of others speak about what is going on to help people in this community and the policies that are being implemented. And some old guy stood up and said, well, actually it was Michael Heseltine who introduced that in the early, to, you know, and so you get all of that kind of stuff. Um, and as a journalist, I had similar experiences to yourself probably, where sometimes you're sat in a room with someone going, what, <laughs> you know, really? Um, it's not surprising. Um, and I know like uh, in the research I was doing for the shame game, um, you know, people who were, I read a book by, I um, can't remember his name, uh, who was, a, I think he was a speech writer, and he was talking about how this kind of language around denigrating people in poverty was was not only just used all the time, but used by very senior people in a way that like it would not be used to um, denigrate other marginalized groups. Um, and to him, and I agree, I definitely agree with him on this, to him it was like it showed a, a, you know, a sort of clear contempt for people who um, were from poorer backgrounds or on benefits. Um, and that explains a lot about why this fight wasn't fought to defend people who were marginalized or vulnerable because of their economic status. Um, I think that, ex that explains a lot. So let's turn to the, you, you kind of, the twist it concept and the framing issue and your, yeah. so in a way we're agreeing that <laughs> things are pretty badly broken. And yeah. how do we, how do we get onto a different, into a different place, Mary? And what's your, what's been your thinking? And what have you learned over the years writing this? Well, fundamentally, that it's not just a political issue, right? I mean, it's a cultural issue. Um, so lo looking at it purely through a prism of politics um, narrows it to such a degree um, that you're already limiting what you're doing. And I mean, again, I'm looking at both America and Britain in this regard and started looking into like the work that George Lakoff was doing and looking back over the decades in terms of how people who might define themselves as a progressive um, frame the issues that they're talking about. But the thing that really fascinated me actually wasn't so much what um, progressives or people on the left um, weren't doing, it was how effective others were at what they were doing. Um, and it can be like a really kind of simple example of a frame, which is, you know, referring to tax as a burden, you know, reducing the tax burden, right? So that means for it to be a burden, it has to be a problem. So you're automatically in a very clear and very quick way communicating a message to the broader culture that tax is a burden. Um, and you see it, once you, once you look at it, you see it everywhere. And then you see these frames and the, the rhetoric being sort of just adopted by media and repeated by media um, and again, especially in America where everyone's obsessed with impartiality and journalism, et cetera, they would say, no, we are not part of the problem. We are not, no, but you are repeating the framing and the same like climate, look, climate change, you know, climate change as a term was manufactured so that it sounded more benign than climate crisis or something that was genuinely as scary as climate crisis is. So I think on, on the right of the political spectrum, um, for 40 years, there's been a lot of work that has gone on in think tanks, et cetera, et cetera, on how you message. And they got very good at it. And once you start seeing how good it is, it's kind of like, okay, that, that explains a lot. That explains why people who are reasonable people, moderately minded people, um, even people who are, you know, who consider themselves on the left, um, have these things fed to them so often that they often adopt and internalize them themselves. And then that makes it easier 
to um, buy into this idea that you know you are different and other people are the problem. And you can see it across all the social issues. You can see it across climate. You can see it across immigration. You can see it across race. It's it's just everywhere. Um, and so it occur, it, it, you know, when I started looking at this, I thought there must be other people looking at this. Um, and there are across the US and in Britain, there are people looking at this. Um, uh, so like the narrative initiative um, in the US, which is, um, I think it's funded by the Ford Foundation, um, established to look at this specifically across a range of social issues. Firstly, find out what is happening, you know, why is it happening? Why is it so effective? And then begin that process of unpicking it and working out how you challenge it and how, you know, because it's not, it's not like this is the reality. It's just, this is the constructed reality according to the goals that you have as a group or as an individual set yourself. So there's lots of, um, you know, obviously lots of academics looking at this. There's lots of researchers looking at this. There's lots of grassroots organizations trying to figure out how they get a message across, how they can influence policy um, because they haven't been able to do it until now. Um, in the US, you've got, uh, you know, the Democratic Party, um, you know, there's all the debates at the moment around who's a moderate and who's a progressive, et cetera. But in many ways, when you look at them, they have shied away from anything that could be termed even remotely radical, um, but it's only radical by the definitions that have been set. Uh, and that's beginning to shift. Trump helped that, but that's beginning to shift. Um, and during the course of researching this book of setting up Project Twisted, I began to realize that there are lo there's lots and lots of work going on. It's just that the people doing it aren't necessarily connected to each other. It's not necessarily a movement or anything, but I think there's a growing recognition that, um, especially with disinformation and misinformation um, spreading like wildfire um, in politics, people are becoming more aware that actually this isn't, um, what we're being told isn't necessarily what is real. And that's that's not just a Trump thing or that's like literally, we have to start looking at this differently and build, you know, even look at how you build a program. So there's a guy in Northern California called Mars Lim Miller, who was, he's like a, he was a social worker for 30 years. He set up something called the Family Independence Initiative because he is a social worker um, and a senior social worker running programs to benefit people in poverty. He grew up in poverty. And he's thinking, I've interviewed him a number of times over a 10 year period. And he was saying, so I'm someone who grew up in poverty to an immigrant single mother. I work as a social worker and I wouldn't want to use the services that I am supposed to deliver to people because I, as a person who is trying to help people, I'm actually reinforcing the idea that they need my help, that I know better than these people know how to live their lives. So we set up an initiative where actually it's the people who are in low income communities, who are in need of assistance, who design the systems around themselves and what works for them. And guess what happens when, when you do something like that? Um, suddenly the um the parents are doing night classes um and getting end up getting better jobs just because they're all supporting each other and like that idea like i don't like the word empowerment right because it's it suggests that you're you are as someone with um superior knowledge um you know aiding people and empowering them to do something when actually that's already there so it's about capacity not empowerment um looking at Mars's work, you, you kind of see, okay, this is, he's been developing this for 10 years. Um, he's written a book about uh, um, like everything you think you know about poverty is wrong. Um, you know, fantastic like toolbox for hard not to screw this up um, and not to get lost in your own sense of uh, righteousness uh, as a person working in this space on any level. Um, so there, there's just all of these things going on um, and in the US context, because democracy runs slightly differently here at a local level, these people are all involved in like everything from school boards right up. And watching these building blocks be put in place has been fascinating to me because it's it's happening. We're just not necessarily always aware that it's happening. 
um, how that translates to a national stage or how that translates to um, media um, uh, is another question um, and we'll see where that goes but I've been encouraged by that. So and one of the th so you so narrative for you is it not got two sides to it so you're talking about the, the framing the big policy narratives the way words like burden or benefits get yeah. used or misused but it's also people's stories isn't it do you yeah. want to say a little bit about yeah um, so I mean, why I mean, that's important yeah so like the the poverty narrative itself as i say it is like a sort of two level thing one is on the one hand that people who are poor are poor through their own fault and people and the other side of that is people who are rich are rich through their own efforts and because you know they are smarter than you or better than you and I think those two things work hand in hand you can't have one without the other but one of the things that fascinated me um, is uh, the role of storytelling has to play in this um, and that's why I ended up working with so many writers and artists um, because you know like a novel that deals with these issues might have more potential to reach a lot of people and to make them think than you know some slogans or you know an anti-poverty um, advertising campaign or something like that and the individual stories that humanize the people affected that put a face on the problem and I by that I don't mean case studies so as a journalist um you know that's I know that that's what gets used you kind of go oh here's an issue um bedroom tax benefits um cap two child limit go find people who fit this bill and they can you know talk about the problem one of the things that clearly comes across is if all you're ever talking about is that issue um, and putting a person's face on it, then you're, you're missing a trick really because those people have more to say about the wider issues than you might give them credit for. So how you tell those stories matter? Um, are you reinforcing the idea of victimhood? Um, are you reinforcing or othering people? Uh, you know, and I, I do think journalism has a lot to answer for and that even well-meaning journalism. Um, and we've got a lot to think about how we tell those stories in the future, where we find those stories. Um, and that that's not to say that's easy because, you know, certainly, you know, there are fewer journalists around to do this kind of work. Um, there's not the money or resources to give people to properly go and do it, but there are some good examples of it. And so if you look at, you know, if you look at the journey from like full on poverty porn on television to something like the Mighty Red Car, which um, looked at it very, very differently, um, you know, that's entirely possible to do. Um, it's empathetic. It comes from the people themselves. It's their stories. Um, and I think that's like a prime example of how you can tell a story without having to demonize people, without having to turn them into some kind of clownish figure um, for you to poke fun at. Uh, but it's not just limited to sort of documentary or reality TV. The more stories that are told um, in film, in soaps, in whatever it is, um, then the more we come to sort of absorb that rather than just this constant barrage of negativity. Um, and so I think that, you know, there's a lot to be done across a lot of platforms. Um, anybody who's involved in storytelling and not, you, know, you could be like, you could be a sort of performance poet or, you know, a rock star. But if what you're putting down is being listened to by people um, and maybe they're getting messages that are slightly different from the ones that are coming from elsewhere, then maybe you create a better understanding of these things. Because I do think the wider culture has a big part to play. Um, if we focus only on politics, then, you know, that's just a, one narrow strand of a much bigger picture. But is there, is there not a challenge here, Mary, that like if we do it as only a cultural problem, we miss the fact that it will take politics to eradicate or massively yeah. mitigate poverty yeah. itself, won't it? It's not, it's not only a cultural problem, though. That's the thing, is it? It's just that to deny that it's a that the culture has a big role to play and possibly shifting, um, shifting it um, is to miss a trick too. I think that, you know, I, this is something that always kind of gets me. I, 
you know, not everybody's politically engaged. Um, and I wish they were, do you know what I mean? I wish everybody, but I can understand why people are turned off by politics as well. So if you're that person, who reaches you? Who, you know, who, who reflects your view of the world? Um, and I'm very conscious as someone who's a journalist, et cetera, that you can get, you can get sucked into that particular vacuum of um, only political action and miss a trick. Doesn't mean that political action isn't important or isn't fundamental, um, like, you know, collective action, et, et cetera. You know, there's no way you'd overturn policies or structural inequities without that fight being had in that field. But I do think that there has to be a recognition. You know, there's a reason why a lot of people don't vote. There's a, you know, there's a reason why, I mean, people I know from my own life couldn't name a single cabinet minister. Um, they don't give a toss. It's, you know, and not because, they don't think this matters, but they don't think anybody speaks to them. Um, and so I think you can't, you know, whatever we're doing, we can't do it without recognizing that, without recognizing that people have been so alienated, so pushed away that, um, you know, that leaves them open to very clever um, strategists who push certain messages um, that keep them in that place. But if we take, for instance, um so you know i'm going to talk about basic income at this point <laughs> okay yeah. but like so basic income is a is a policy proposal so in that sense it's political yeah but it's rooted in um kind of an idea of our universality our equality the fact that we're all really in this together um it it's uh, the arguments for it are kind of often are kind of quite cultural or about reevaluating what we think is important supporting people who want to make different kinds of contribution in a way they're trying to turn the whole kind of economic machinery that's mm -hmm. part of the culture culture creating system they're trying to turn that either on its head or on its side mm -hmm. and i think the thing that i mean intrigues me if like so part of the poverty industry now is talking about uh, oh well we need an anti-poverty social movement i don't see how as soon as you start saying like, there's quite a good movement at the moment called ACORN. They're very mm -hmm. focused on housing, right? That's because like, they're organizing people in a trade union around a practical issue. And immediately they start looking at things you can do on the ground and then things you can do politically. Yeah. Um, the UBI lab group that we set up in Sheffield, there are now 35 groups. Immediately they're looking at what can we do in our local community? It's not all Westminster. But what can yeah. we also do together to bring about change? And that seems to be a bit, I, I don't know what your observation is, but I feel like the, the poverty industry, all the people spending millions of pounds solving poverty, something that they haven't seemed to have done very well over the last 40 years, mm. have got a bit stuck. They haven't engaged with actually accounts of how we crack the, actually do, actually solve the problem, at least the problem of poverty, that would engage people. Because if, and, and there's a danger there also if it becomes like merely cultural. I know that's not your argument, but you know what I mean? It's like, oh, if only people have different beliefs. No, actually, we need to radically redistribute resources. <laughs> that's a, that's yeah, kind of rather important to cracking well, it, this problem. It, it is. The question is, how do you convince people that that is important or that it's possible? Um, and like one of the things that, has always struck me throughout like you know poverty campaigning and things like that is just presenting facts statistics etc does not penetrate um you know and again i say i've got a strange perspective on this as a journalist rather than a researcher because you know i can imagine being in the newsroom it's quite adrenalized story comes in oh my god another four hundred thousand kids are in poverty you know, put a headline up, bam, it's in, it's gone. It's like outrage for a day. Um, if you ask someone on the street, what do you think of 400,000 kids being in public? Oh, that's terrible, that's terrible. And then that's it, you know. So it, it's sort of like, um, you can't do one without the other. They are absolutely intertwined. Um, you know, you can present all the evidence you like for something that is a really, really good idea that you know is going to reduce poverty, but how the hell do you convince people, you know, that 
it is and that it should be done when there are vested interests who are trying not to make that happen. Um, so I think it's all completely interrelated. And I do think your point about what happens at a community level, and that, that's why I'm, I'm, talk, I'm constantly talking about, um, so what are you doing in your community that's making it work? Because suddenly you have like real life examples of how something is flourishing. And then when someone comes out and goes, that'll never work, that'll bankrupt everybody. And you're kind of like, mm, well, actually it didn't. So like one of the examples in the US is the minimum wage. They have a different argument here around that to the UK. So in the UK, it seems to me anyway, that lots more people are on board with living wages and stuff like that. That seems to somehow have penetrated. Here, the federal minimum wage has been the same for 10 years, which, you know, and everything that means economically, but because a mayor of a big city or a governor of a state can institute their own minimum wage, they become actual incubators for um, proving that this is not going to bankrupt businesses. They're not going under. Workers get more money. They then spend that money in the economy. We can identify that because it's a microcosm of a larger um, economy. And so I think all of those building blocks matter because that's what you then get to use to, you know, try and win over the people who are studiously trying not to be won over or have been convinced by, you know, another argument. So, uh, I think it'd be good. And uh, Richard has offered to be a, a bit of a help here with picking out things for people to ask questions about. So I'm just going to warn Richard that maybe this will be my last point to you. And then maybe we've got about half an hour for him to pick up questions. Is that okay, Richard? Um, well, I suppose in a way, I'm, I, yeah, I suppose I just want to push on this thing that you say, well, how do you persuade people? And you're right, everything you say about statistics is right. I mean, everything we published, the center published about austerity, showing how unnecessary it was, how damaging it was, had no impact. I mean, mm. and, and actually had no traction in mainstream media. So, mm. you know, we kind of really understand how and you can show people statistically how yeah. most benefits um, actually just paid straight back in tax. So the headline benefit bill is absolutely meaningless. Yeah. It's only 13% of the benefit bill actually get, reaches people. So it, it's, a, it's an absolute nonsense, the whole thing. And, and one of the fundamentals about human beings that I suppose I've got to deal with is that people are crap at maths at some level. I mean, people really... I, I genuinely think that most of the time people just don't have time to think about, you know... It's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, no, that's part, know, part of the reason for a basic income, isn't it, in a way, to give people... Yeah, but it's also part of the reason why the messaging um, on the other side of these arguments is so effective because if you say something really quite simple, um, use metaphors that people can understand, appeal to what they think is their common decency, but actually is the reverse, and you do it over and over and over again, it hits the mark. It like it hits the mark. It, it hits the mark so effectively that if you're, it's it's kind of like the whole thing. You're coming to um, a. a you're coming to a gun battle with a knife or something like that. Do you know what I mean? You're like, you're coming with the wrong wrong weaponry um, because they're not talking about statistics all the time. They're talking about, you know, they're crafting a story that um, people who are going about their everyday business can absorb. Yeah. Um, and, and but, but, but isn't that, Mary, that, that's the attraction of basic income for me. It's like, and that's, and, and to be fair, you know, when people do polling on this, basic income scores really well. It's not universal credit. It's like some mysterious black box to make misery out of life. <laughs> it, it, Does anybody do try and explain universal credit? And yeah, exactly. Head? If you say to people, if you say to people, everybody should get enough to live on, people can grasp that. And people, people do say, oh, that sounds good. So it's already something that there is a positive possibility of using as part of developing a social understanding that we don't need to live with this. And that's where I suppose just I'm a bit frustrated with all of the people in the poverty industry say, well, no, you can't do it. It's too difficult. Or, but that's not that difficult. It's no more difficult than saying, you know what, healthcare, we just provide it free for everyone because that's the same and decent thing to do. And that's what we do. And we've done it for, you know, 70 odd years quite successfully, despite keep electing Tory governments. So, 
you know, why, why isn't this part of the culture war is to say, hey, you know, folks, there's a solution for some of this. It looks like this. We give each other enough to live on. That's the basic case for basic income. You can say it in a sentence. Uh, it's not complicated. There's no maths involved. I mean, you can, there are conversations you can have off with policy wonks about the maths. But actually, as part of the culture wars, isn't it rather fundamental just to say, you know, we owe it to each other to take care of each other and make sure everybody's got enough because we sure got enough resource. That's not the problem. I'm trying to overturn, this is why when I was approaching the book, I was trying to figure out, well, where are we? You know, where are we on this? Who's doing what on this? What's happening? Um, and that's why I kind of think, you know, we're sort of just off the starting blocks on a lot of things. Um, and the first part of that is recognizing what we've done that hasn't worked and why it hasn't worked. And you can't get to selling your solutions really until you've unpicked that a little and then go at people with the solutions and um, and sell them like crazy. Um, and know, But knowing that you're doing that after decades of the entrenchment of certain notions of um, people and motiv their motivations and their place in the world. So, you know, I sort of think this is no easy task. None of this is easy, um, but recognizing what has stopped progress being made is the first step to that. Um, looking at what has been successful in terms of entrenching particular understandings of poverty and poor people. Um, and then figuring out how you bring the right tools to um, to the job. And I think at the minute we don't bring the right tools to the job. So therefore, you know, you might have, you know, you might have built a great foundation for something, but if you haven't brought the bricks to build the house, then the house isn't going to build itself, sort of thing. So I think, I mean, that that's kind of where I'm at on it. And I'm still learning stuff every day that makes me think about what might be possible. Um, but I, you know, I, it's, it's always difficult because, you know, policy silos are one thing, you know, you can end up with social care being here, health being there, you know, housing being there, when actually, of course, they're all absolutely interrelated. Um, but, you know, for UBI, I mean, I think there's, there's a lot of very solid, very sound arguments that have been made in favor of it, but they, at the moment, they're kind of being made to the people who are in that universe of sort of study or policy rather than the general public yeah well maybe i think that's a bit harsh the community groups that we're forming are just community groups they're not academic groups it has been you're right that it has been a purely academic exercise until the last two or three years but i think we're starting to change yeah, that i think the same okay. is happening in america the andrew yang that, campaign okay, right because the thing is if you don't as i said if you don't build your foundation then you're going to get knocked down pretty fast so all of this stuff is important the question becomes at what stage can you do the next thing that needs to be done to get it to where you want it to be um and i think yeah. there's a there's just a lot of stuff going on around that um you know all over the place that is very very interesting to me and the question becomes does it get leveraged in a way that is um effective on a bigger and broader scale um i'll just sort of say for a minute because you know the elephant in the room at the moment is the pandemic right so this year has been you know odd and stressful in so many ways but one of the things that seems to have happened um is because it has you know, ravage the economy and people are, you know, worried about their jobs who might not have been worried about their jobs before. And I think when the dust settles a little on this, it will be really interesting to see if people's attitudes have shifted fundamentally in any way in terms of this idea that I'm all right, Jack, or I worked hard, so therefore I, you know, I'm not um, sucking at the teeth of government and unless suddenly, a, catas a catastrophe happens that means you lose your job and for the first time you're having to encounter something like universal credit and maybe you go what the hell is this this is a mess is this all you get what if, what are they telling us that people are like robbing the state blind on benefits when you know i can't even buy a tube of toothpaste i think think i'll be really interested to see what happens when the dust settles on that and if there if there is some kind of momentum for um a benefits system that isn't 
based on um, demonizing people that isn't based on conditionality um, and that actually accepts, you know, that sometimes shit just happens and um, that doesn't mean that you are a bad person and it doesn't mean that you're not a decent person or whatever language you want to slap on it. So I'll be, I'll be fascinated to see what happens with that and if it has really made inroads into how people view this more broadly. Yes. Yeah, so so I've put, if anybody wants to put a question to... Mary, put an H in the chat bar and we'll turn you on. <laughs> uh, somehow I'll find the right thing to click. Or Richard, Simon. my friend Richard, now we'll find the right thing to click. I, I can help with that, actually. And I think I think Ben's got a question, a good question there. I don't know if, Ben, if you'd like to ask the question um, to um, Mary and Simon directly, I'll unmute you. Um, or would you prefer that um, I just read it out? Uh, no, I'm fine to ask the question. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, it was just around, um, I've been thinking a lot recently about whether COVID and the sort of message from the mainstream media that we're kind of all in this together, that we're struggling and that's okay, will make those who really are in poverty and not in some kind of, obviously lots of people have been hit by COVID and there's people in temporary poverty, if you will, but those who have been in poverty for years and have had that struggle, that 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 they will internalise that and make that struggle, the media will make them think that it's more acceptable and that some of the provision, that whether that be food banks or other food provision or um, that that is somehow acceptable when actually and it's dignified when probably a lot of us here mm. know that it isn't but because there's this message that people are doing good and helping the community that yeah. they start to believe that more than they did prior to COVID. Yeah I, mean, I don't know I think that's I think that's a real risk because it was a, a risk even before that the normalization of it um, you know the sort of regression to this idea that um, charity is the way that you solve these problems. And of course it feeds into that wider narrative around um, you're a good person. If you, if you go to the supermarket and put a few things in a basket for the food bank, it's been, a, it's been really effectively marketed. Um, even though the organizations that run them are going, we shouldn't be here. We're not supposed to be here. Do you know, it's like, we're just not supposed to be here but I think you're right I think that has become intensely normalized and certainly before COVID it was already reaching that point um, where it's you know you'd have the spectacle of um, government ministers going to a food bank to give out for a photo op to give out food to people and they cause the problem in the first place yeah it's been very effective normalizing of something that shouldn't exist and how do you think we counteract that because I think certainly um, I mean I work for Church Action on Poverty alongside people with lived experience and even people that I work with who are doing some of that hands-on grassroots mm -hmm. work just who live in poverty themselves but the the volunteering five days a week cooking meals with people from their own kitchen and things and they do like I worry about them for the, their own kind of men, mental health and well-being because they're not in a great place themselves but it's yeah. almost like they feel they have a responsibility and they normalize that and they don't think that that sort of mutual aid is something that we should be questioning and it's almost seen as like a, not that we should yeah work in the community is great but it shouldn't be something that should replace something that doesn't exist so how do you have those conversations that because a lot of the people I talk to they just think that it's almost their duty and they don't they're not yeah they are angry about certain things but they don't seem angry about that but <laughs> I am <laughs> no no I know and I've encountered that a million times myself um in spaces with people where they you know, you, you want to be able to say, don't you see that this is just making the problem worse? Um, and then you become the kind of 
sort of lecturing paternalistic person in 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 one way to them and i mean i i i don't have all the answers obviously nobody does or we've figured it out already but i think what what it's an example of is the selling of this message that um you know we're we are all in this together i mean that's a powerful very simple thing um and it is something that someone can do and see evidence of they're doing it very quickly and they will feel a little bit better about themselves for having done it. Um, so it's remarkably kind of um, tantalizing really to, uh, and this is kind of why, this is why I'm trying to grapple with this stuff. Why did these particular messages penetrate even people who are on the receiving end of the policies that these messages reinforce. Um, and I do think we're just at the very start of like a very long battle, but it we can't fight it the way it's been fought before. Um, I do think it's a failure of politics on the left as well. I mean, it's just <laughs> like it is, um, you know, the election system has a lot to do with it, but it's almost, you know, Britain's almost a one party state. Um, and the media does a very fine job of reinforcing that. So I, you know, I understand why people react the way they react because they're doing what they can do within the limits of their universe, their communities, their families. Um, people look at someone suffering and want to help them. And that's a laudable thing. It's just that that impulse is being exploited um, by very, uh, very able communicators. I went to uh, speak to some very senior church people. I won't say who they are because of what I'm going to tell you. Um, it, I was told that um, in 2010, the Church of England basically did a deal with the Conservative Party and the coalition government to allow welfare reform and austerity, not to resist it, not to make too much of an issue out of it, in order to get the international aid level that they wanted. Mm. So there's a politics to this, which is also going on behind the scenes, where people's lives are being traded by people who think that they're better than all of us and who can make these decisions for us. Um, and I think we, we do need to try and challenge some of these institutions. I... I, I, I I do think the intermediary, and I mean, and this is maybe me just being a troublemaker, but the, the intermediary institutions, like the church, the civil society groups, Joseph Browntree Foundation, they're interesting players in this. If you ask a Tory MP why they resist basic income, they cite JRF. That's, that's the letter they write to their constituent. So I, I, I think they, it's interesting. If you ask the Tory MP, what did they say to you um, is their reason, their actual reason for rejecting this as a, a viable um, move? I mean, they, they say, they cite an article from the JRF saying basic income won't solve poverty, therefore it's a bad they have idea. No thoughts, they've no thoughts of their own on it. They just sort of go, oh, well, so-and-so said this, so therefore I believe it. Well, I'm, I'm sure they do have thoughts of their own, Mary, but the, it's, it's interesting to me, the whole of austerity, what really reveals is the collapse of the integrity of civil society. Mm. Like politicians basically don't like having opinions of their own. Yeah, it's hard. It's much easier to be able to cite something. Think tanks provide yeah. usually well, the explicit well, rationale <laughs> and charities and church yeah. provide kind of background rationale and journalists. Yeah, well, that was what was my next point was going to be because you know there's a reason why American think tanks try to get a foothold in Britain because they see it as fertile ground, right? They see that half the work has already been done for them, um, and I think you cannot, un you know, there would not be being huge quantities of money put into these ideas factories if it didn't work. You know, these guys are not going to waste money. Um, pumping it into think tanks if it's not effective. Not, 
that does make it a not very level playing field because they've got wads of cash going into these things, manufacturing these ideas, um, you know, the obvious, you know, Ian Duncan Smith references and, you know, which Tory MPs are on the boards of these things and how you can't tell where their money is actually coming from, but they appear on news channels as if they're a legit organisation with, you know, I think all of that matters. And it, it, it means that the playing field is not level if you're trying to counteract that because it is inordinately um, powerful. It's backed up by a lot of money and it's backed up by a compliant media. So the civil, the civil society organizations, big issue. But I, I think you just, for, from the work that I've been doing, I just don't think it, you can underestimate like what, why that money is going to where it's going and why it is as effective as it is delivering its goals. And it didn't just appear from nowhere. The, you know, back in the early seventies, a lot of people got together to figure out how they could build these sorts of organizations and fund them and penetrate the lobby industry and penetrate um, mainstream politics. So they didn't do that overnight either. Um, you know, so I think the struggle to, you know, counteract that, we're almost like where they were in the 70s without the money. But, but I, yeah, but some <laughs> organizations have a lot of money, Mary. Yeah, no, I'm not talking a about- A lot of money. money. I'm not, talking, I'm not talking about established organizations that are doing whatever they're doing. I'm saying that if you are trying to build an alternative to whatever the current situation is, yeah. then you're basically back in the 70s in terms of how long it's going to take. So it's not like established organizations are what they are. They're doing what they're doing. I mean, you know my view on the fact that I don't think that like anti-poverty strategies have worked because they clearly haven't. Um, so... There's, there's that, but I think in terms of where we are, um, the, I think the, the tough thing is that we're right almost at the very start of a very long and difficult um, journey. And that's the difficult thing to sort of, I don't know, absorb, I suppose. Two good Sorry, questions in the chat. So yes. should we let Les, let, is Les there to ask his question directly? Yes, yes. I think you've just come off mute, Les. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, Mary. Uh, so, hi. Given you so slightly ideal thinking, then slightly ahead of where you think we are. Given you laid the foundations, got the tools. Who should we be targeting with that that new message of the lived experience of poverty? You know that centred sort of message and the solutions for it. So, who who is it we're aiming at, or should be aiming at? Well, I think it's bit, it has to be the people who aren't already convinced of the argument. It's, you know, I, you know, and I can again say this as someone who's written for, you know, The Guardian for a long, long time. You're aware that you are preaching to the converted. Yeah. You know, you're aware that people are already on side. Um, I think the, like, the interesting thing that happened this year with Marcus Rashford, for instance, who has an audience that follows him not for politics and not for social issues, but because he's a very fine footballer. Um, and that will be a whole hodgepodge of people from various different um, walks of life. And suddenly they're being told by someone they adore um, that they need to think about this um, and here's why. And he has an influence way beyond his 22 years and his own life experience. Uh, so I think, the first thing to do is to look at who's delivering the message um, because it's very, very hard to win people over with the ammunition that we tend to have used to win people over. And if you've got people who are, and this is again where I talk a lot about the cultural stuff and getting artists and all kinds of people involved because they reach people in a different way. Yeah. Um, often reach people in a very emotional way in a, you know, in a very emotional way that makes them feel something about the issue, um, might make them just go, oh, right, I hadn't really thought about that, you know, um, and that's where you start. I mean, I don't see how you can start any other way. And it's also the thing, you know, these, which is why having these sort of stories woven into dramas, woven into, you know, the, the, the stuff that people watch for their leisure um, is, you know, can you infiltrate that in a way that makes people think slightly differently? 
Um, I'm, you know, I did a lot of work with young people for Project Twisted. Um, and a lot of those young people were from average middle class backgrounds, for instance. And so we did um, work with them. They made little films and all kinds of things um, alongside kids from different backgrounds. And the, a lot of these kids wouldn't get to meet normally because, you know, we live in a segregated society. If, you, if you're poor, you probably tend to spend your time with other people in the same lower income bracket. So, but watching these teenagers get together and talk about this stuff, um, and you, see, you can almost see the light bulb going on in their head. Oh shit, I didn't think about that. You know, I didn't think about my privilege. I didn't think about um, the fact that when you come to school, you genuinely feel ashamed because you don't have what I have. Uh, so on, on that very kind of micro level of young people who aren't fixed in their notions of the world and who are probably energized in a way to campaign around ideas and issues um, and influence each other. Um, I think all, all of that, like, all of that is part of the solution to this. Um, it's no one thing, but who delivers that message, how we can get people to be together and talk um, and not just chuck things at each other is kind of important. I mean, it might sound idealistic, but it's just that, you know, on a personal level for me, you know, I grew up in Northern Ireland. I grew up right beside a peace line um, and witnessed a lot of um, unnecessary and excruciating hatred and othering um, and I always felt like, you know, actually the kids on the other side of that wall were working class kids like me. And I had more in common with them than I did with the people in the big houses up the street. Um, so I, I just, you know, but when you start breaking those things down, when there is, you know, a genuine will, uh, even on a community level to change things and the people helping change it aren't necessarily the people who are involved in the poverty industry or whatever you want to call it, then maybe you have a chance at, you know, getting the crack in the wall that lets you get your food through. Um, but like that's I say, like, oh. that's just, I think that's where we're at right now, so. Yeah. So Les, Les you got your hand up. Have you got a yeah, follow up to that? And then I'm gonna ask um, Alison if, if you wanna ask your question then, if that's okay. Sure, it's just two things, Mary, I thought it was really interesting. On, on the second one about the, the telling stories, you know, if you've got uh, Spielberg telling these stories, if you're fully mainstream, this is what you want. I mean, EastEnders started off like this and they'd berated it so long, didn't they, for being bleak and having yeah, you know, yeah. people marry the single... Yeah, but that know. assumes that everything is bleak, you see, and that's, that's the other thing that gets me is kind of, um, you know, I sit down with anybody who grew up in poverty like myself, right? If I sit down with anybody, within two seconds, we're joking. Within two seconds, it's humorous. Um, yeah. You know, it, this isn't a one dimensional, um, the world is dumping on me because that actually strips people of their agency and their dignity and assumes that they um, don't fight every single day tooth and nail to make the best of their lives. But also, you know, people do joke and people do have fun despite shitty circumstances because that's how you cope with it. But, you know, you don't put that in a case study in a newspaper about benefits caps. Um, so people's what the information that people receive about people in these circumstances through news in particular is always around the affliction, the misery, the da, 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 da. I mean, Jesus, I don't recognize any of, of that, you know, and I, you know, I recognize sitting in my sister's living room, getting a bit drunk maybe, and, you know, sharing a bit of crack, you know, um, as in the Irish kind, um, but <laughs> you know what I mean? And I think drama can do that, I think. But, and I'll shut up in a minute because this is another bugbear, which is about, you have to have representation within these institutions. You have to have people from working class backgrounds and from poorer backgrounds doing the writing, doing the producing, doing the directing in the same way that you need disabled people in there to represent that community. You need black people in there to represent, you know, this is what you need. Um, and that's a whole other issue, but that is absolutely part of a longer term solution is the representation of people that can reflect the full nature of a particular life experience rather than just the one dimensional um, fictionalized version of it. So the, the next question is from uh, Alison. Um, Alison, it's about UBI. So is this a question for 
uh, Simon or for uh, Mary? Uh, I'm, I'm muted, aren't I? Um, well, should I just say it and then yeah, yeah. people could yeah. answer if they like? Um, yeah, so I'm part of UBI Lab Manchester. Um, so I'm coming from the UBI Lab perspective and we've got, I, I, I feel like there's a lot going on in terms of lobbying, but we're looking at movement building, trying to get people involved, like Simon was saying. And it's easy to go all sort of Dominic Cummings on it and look at, um, somebody's going to walk in now and ask me if I want my tea. <laughs> sorry about that. To, uh, to look at, um, sorry, can I just hold it on a second? <laughs> this is real life. Yeah, see? <laughs> Mine, mine's two sugars, Alison, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's got to be a good cup of tea. <laughs> oh, there we are. Oh, we've got to unmute you again. Uh, Alison, you're on mute. Um, I've clicked ask to unmute. There That's it. Sorry. Um, I... I went to the webinar the, from the Royal Society of Arts on looking at different um, demographics, different um, people who were on the sort of like the innovation curve of, you know, sort of early adopters and late adopters and then that sort of thing. And there's different things that they find appealing about UBI. And it's a question of where do you go with that? Do you, do you start, if you're talking about the sort of things you were talking about at the beginning, Mary, of what people believe about poverty. So, some people don't like the message from UBI that it's all about fairness and we should all just get it anyway. They look at it from the point of view, it will encourage work. It will encourage people to go back into work. So it's a sort of moral thing that, 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 that it's okay. So it's not just a question of, yes, we're all, you know, we should all be allowed to have this because it's our right sort of thing. In America, they've done stuff, Andrew Yang's done stuff, and they called it the, the dividend freedom because they believe that... They believe that it's, um, you know, it's peace, it is people's rights. So it's that sort of thing of what do we? I don't know the sort of the moral aspect of how you have how, have how you message it, how you package it, how you get it over. Thank you. Yeah, and it's a bit interesting. Like the NHS, um, the 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 back history to the NHS is kind of interesting because it's quite like now the story is very much like almost slightly idealised. Um, it's it's a sense of oh well at this point these people came together and said you know we should have this wonderful system but actually what was going on was the whole of the healthcare system was in a complete mess and they didn't know how to organise the funding after the war and and so actually it was kind of easy and they deluded themselves that actually the initial expense would disappear because they'd make everybody healthy. <laughs> so, I mean, one of the lessons I think is that social policy, what drives the immediately what drives social policy is often not really the truth or it's a, it is a, it's a kind of messy business, isn't it? And, uh, you know, what I believe isn't necessarily what somebody else believes is, is morally the most important argument. Mm. And people are motivated by very different things. I, I think, think that, that there is a kind of, this is my view of the way the world is churn, turning, and I would probably go along with Guy Standing's view here, that, and, and that, that there are things going on in the economy and in the development of technology, which means that the underlying game is shifting, and that therefore the appeal to economic security and a greater sense of productivity will have greater resonance even though it's not in the political mainstream now. And that's one of the tensions, isn't it? So you can you can make it in the political mainstream now, even the Tories actually accepted. I think uh, David Cameron stood on a party conference and admitted the truth, which is the poor are taxed more than any other group. And then used that as an excuse to introduce the horror, which is universal credit. But there was an admission there that the system is massively unjust in so many different dimensions, even for a little minute. So you can get people to do have universal credit was all set up around that work incentive to work argument, where basic income is a much better argument. I mean, it's a much better system from that narrow perspective. So we're a bit torn, I think, in the movement, aren't we, between appealing to where the argument is and maybe appealing to where maybe for some of us, at least where our hearts are. And there are other arguments, as you know well, Alison. So it is a really good question. 
It'd be interesting, yeah, Mary, from your perspective, thinking about assumptions about poverty, where do you think the, yeah, well, it makes the me cracks think, might be? It makes me think, because I suppose like when someone is immersed in the subject, is immersed in the area, um, so you might know 20 fantastic reasons why you be and I should be introduced tomorrow. Um, but the point about the RSA thing and the audience segmentation, or to use the jargon, um, you know, like back in the day when I used to work in advertising and things and sponsorship and things like that, I was constantly looking at audience segmentation and, you know, what are your Venn diagrams, which messages um, make an impression on which group. So you might have four thematic arguments for why UBI should be introduced and is a good thing, but not every one of those audience segments will respond to each one of those. So the question is, which one do you push in which direction? So for policymakers, for um, MPs, for whatever, there will be certain things you will be talking about productivity. But if you're trying to reach a general audience, talking about productivity levels going up, will be like, yeah, so what does that even mean? I don't know what that means. Does that mean I'm going to work more hours as a result of this? Do you know what I mean? I think you can have a different message for each one of those audiences and deliver it in a different way. Um, and that whole idea to make the emotional appeal will work for some people to make a pragmatic economic appeal will work for others, um, but they all won't work for everybody. Um, and in fact, some people might be hostile to a certain kind of message um, because they're already buying into this idea. Well, if you just give people money, you're paying people to sit on the couch watching um, TV all day. Um, and no matter what you say, that might not change their mind, but is there something else within your like bag of um, tricks around why this is a good thing that will work with that person, which is why that, that kind of work is interesting, I think, because it tells you what people are receptive to and what they're hostile to. And it's much easier to tap into what they're receptive to than it is to like overcome what they're hostile to. What about sorry, people, Mary? Oh, sorry. I was yeah. just gonna say, I think Les has got um, another quick question uh, following up. But it wasn't really a question. It was about it was there was two things that Mary had said, but one was about who's delivering the message, and 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 for the sort of British audiences, maybe it just might chime. But just just two words, Martin Lewis, just the mm -hmm. audience that he reached, the way he frames it, how he says he doesn't necessarily do the emotional thing, but mm -hmm. as I put in the chat, he makes people feel hmm, a bit smarter for listening to him, yeah. you know, and he's and a great communicator. You know, so he that kind of person, you know, yeah. is, and, and I think for Simon's, you know, what, what you're saying, you know, if, if we see, say UBI is the solution, he he could sell it, surely. I, I was going to sell it to him then. About like uh, just picking up on what Les has said with, I think that's a great idea with, with Martin Lewis. I think, you know, he seems like the, the right person. But um, I've been reading a book recently by um, uh, a chap called Douglas Rushkoff. Great team human throwing rocks at the Google bus. Um, fascinating writer. He came up with the term viral marketing, you know, so he's quite influential, but you know, yeah. not, not too many people heard of him. Um, and uh, he talks about how the medium is as important as the message. In fact, the medium is the message. I think he took that from somewhere else. I can't remember where it is now, but I'm just wondering, as well as the, the person that carries the message, what, what do you think, Mary, about, um, you know, what? Uh, what what mediums to use as well because like the you know the different sort of like from paper print tv internet social media it the meaning changes in the way that it, the message is transmitted as well so just from your yeah yeah i mean i think it's, it's you know i'm no expert in social media or anything like that but um but yeah I mean, like the the medium is the message goes way back to the 60s um, and sort of social theory um, at the time and you know looking at the wider communications canvases and stuff like that um, and it's it, it it's kind of almost going back to come forward because every like if I don't know if, if you've ever worked in a sort of advertising environment um, you know there's a reason why you put a particular message in a particular way on radio or on tv or in a woman's magazine or, you know, you're literally looking at, at the amount of data out there 
on how to reach people is gargantuan. Um, looking at how political campaigns have been using it has been fascinating in the past sort of four or five years, etc. Um, you basically need some experts in this area who can say, here's what we know works um, and here's how you need to do it. And here's, if you've got no money, how you need to do it. Um, and I think without that, you're not, you're just not going to hit the audiences across the different platforms um, because there are so many platforms and, you know, so many people are directly influenced by Facebook and, you know, like the number of people who get their news directly from a news source now is very small. You know, they're going in, they're going in through different portals and different ways in and out of it. Um, but yeah, no, it's definitely like, that's the kind of person you want to be talking to about. How do, how do we break this down? How do we target people? How do we target them with the right message in the right way, in the right space? How do we get them talking about it? Um, all of the people that are working in that arena um, are doing this for all kinds of products and all kinds of issues. And, you know, I was looking at um, some work that Amnesty had done in this area as well about, you know, how you never start with the problem. Um, they began to recognize that if you start talking about the the problem, then you've lost half your audience immediately. So you start by talking about what your solution is, and then you explain what it's a solution to. I mean, it seems very straightforward, but actually, you know, if we're talking about poverty and we're saying poverty is a huge problem, X number of people are affected, X number of kids go hungry, da, da, da. Um, it would seem to suggest that starting with that doesn't work, even though instinctively, because you're in that sphere and that matters to you, you want to talk about it, but starting with the negative doesn't seem to work. <laughs> you know, it seems to me like the the communication and the media technology. It's almost um, analogous to it, like an arms race. So if you think of, um, uh, I often find talk to people about technology I'm from a technology background, and people either think that it's it's awful or it's great. Um, very few people are ambivalent about it. But um, if you think of like Cambridge Analytica and mm. Facebook and Brexit and climate change denial. Um, mm. It's almost like, um, you know, you need maybe, you know, because I think technology can be used for good or evil. Maybe yeah. some of that technology needs to be used for the positive messages and the narrative about, you know, the same technologies, but used in a different way to a different audience and different messages. Yeah. That was kind of why before people had heard of viral marketing and things were going viral. Um, and then suddenly there was a branch of communications all about viral marketing because then they're like, oh yeah, this works, let's do that. So it's kind of like, look at what works and piggyback it. You know, it's like, you know, jump on that wagon and do what you can with it because if it's working, why not use it? Um, you risk, I think, with an issue like poverty, a lot of backlash, a lot of backfiring because people will, you know, follow any thread on this issue and there will be people on there who are banging on about people being lazy. And, you know, I don't know, Simon, but I'm sure you must get this occasionally with UBI. It is just like, you know, why should we pay people to do nothing? Um, and that's their starting point before you even get your first point in about why that's not what the evidence tells us. Um, but yeah, but it is one of the reasons why involving young people who are savvy with this stuff. Um, like I worked with, you know, people like Nadine Shah, um, uh, the band She Drew the Gun, um, with Battersea Arts Centre, um, young people at the Beatbox Academy, you know, to create stuff that goes out to audiences that I wouldn't reach through my journalism, but they can reach um, through their platforms. So working in collaboration with groups or individuals who have different ways of communicating and who are kind of sympathetic to whatever it is you're trying to do. And hopefully that kind of spreads in a way that it wouldn't, if you had done it in the way that you've traditionally done it, like me through journalism or writing a book. I'm conscious that we're hitting the, the hour and a half that we've taken of Mary's time already. There was a question that's just come in from Anne-Marie. Don't know if we've got time to deal with that. I think that relates to my um, strategy of let's let's embarrass civil society into action. <laughs> but um, maybe we shouldn't put Mary in that position of asking her that question when it's just crossed the, uh, the <laughs> threshold. Um, the, um, so maybe I should just 
call things to a close, um, if I'm abusing my position at all, is to just say, Mary's just told us that what we need is a strong, positive idea. I, I say no more. <laughs> um, and um, But to really just thank Mary. And I put the link into Mary's book uh, in the chat, uh, The Shame Game. Um, and... And this is at least one thing we can all do. We can buy Mary's book and we can talk about this. We can even buy it for people's Christmas presents. If you have any relatives you think you'd li like to better understand poverty, that would be a really good thing. Anybody who thinks the poor are perfectly fine and all watching satellite television and lying around on the sofa, um, then you, perhaps that would be a very useful uh, uh, Christmas present. Uh, Mary, do you want to say any kind of last, just last words, whatever you'd like? Well, I just want to thank you for asking me along. Um, I'm not sure I always make a lot of sense, <laughs> but um, I kind of think that with this, so many of us are, are just trying to find our way through it right now and understand how we got to the point that we're at. Um, and I think there's a lot of energy out there to try and figure out a better way forward. Um, for, for me, it's just, I'm just sick and tired of people who, or being blamed for shit that is not their fault. Um, and I'm sick and tired of, you know, the sort of messages that are wheeled out. And if enough people get sick and tired of it, then maybe, maybe there'll be some kind of pushback and maybe it'll come from a, a corner that we're not expecting it to come from, who knows? But um, I'm just kind of sick and tired of it. So I felt like I needed to talk just see what was happening so thanks everybody for coming along to this um and i really appreciate the questions and the engagement it's you know it matters thank you thank you so much mary yes well i think there's a few of us who are sick and tired of it too and we'll <laughs> let's see if we can work together a bit over the coming years to make more people sick and tired of poverty and stigma and shame that associated that's with that's like that your slogan yeah <laughs> i'll sign up for that <laughs> <laughs> all right everybody thank you so much thanks a lot much appreciated all right see you all hopefully some of the time bye yeah, for now bye bye special thanks to richard for coming to my aid <laughs>